Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session of Lens Design. My colleague, Frances, and I are going to present you this session. Uh, I'm going to start with a small, with a short uh, overview of the program, and then we will see how we can develop a full project of landscape design with Lens Design. We will review the beam features of the program, and of course, we are going to follow the decision on Rhino environment. So we are going to have a, an overview of Rhino as well. Well, let's see what's Lens Design. Lens Design is a professional beam landscape software. It's a software for uh, that let us to have a drawing, model the project with, um, in 3D. It automatically generates the list of plants and other materials. And also there are several tools for animation and visualization of the project. Lens Design has two versions. That's why uh, I was asking uh, your knowledge about that. There are two versions. One works on top of AutoCAD and Civil 3D. And another version works on Rhino. So with the same license, you may have both versions. Uh, so it's up to you uh, to choose which version. Um, basically, the program is used in different fields. Uh, apart from landscape architecture, it is used for civil engineering, for urban planning projects, and for environmental projects. Let's see its main features. First of all, Lens Design includes an extensive plant database with over 8,000 plant species. Uh, the plant species have different um, characteristics that you can see here, so you can filter the plant database based on different parameters like uh, the soil type, the climate, the flower color, or any of these filters. Any plant species that you see here, it has a different display modes, as you see the conceptual, detailed, or different blocks. So it, it depends on in which um, representation mode you are working you will see different type of plant species block. This is the conceptual one. By one click, you get another one, which is detail, and the realistic one as well. In realistic form, you can shift between different seasons, and there are many plant species that represent different form in different seasons. Well, you can shift between 2D and 3D just by one click, as you see here. So the same project that you, you can work on it in 2D environment, when you shift to 3D, you see that the 3D uh, of the objects are already existing in the same uh, file. For inserting vegetation, there are multiple ways. You can insert them individually, of course. But you can insert them by paint mode. Just by moving the mouse, you can insert plants uh, in this way. Or you can insert them by converting points to plant species. So if you have just some points or if you have some blocks, you can convert the blocks, AutoCAD blocks or any kind of blocks to plant species of land design. You can insert them in a row or in a group of plants by forest command. Uh, the group or row may be combined with different plant species. As you see, you can insert shrubs. You indicate the number of units per square meter or per linear meter of uh, shrubs, as well as ground cover plants. Also, there is an, a plant editor inside the program that lets us to edit plants if you want to change the color or any kind of um, parameters of any plant species. You can do that easily with that add-on inside the program. There are powerful terrain modeling tools that let us to create terrain by points, lines, or combination of points and lines. Once we generate the terrain, we can easily modify it. We can, by moving the control points, we can do different operations like creating a pass or creating cotton fields on top of the terrain. And land design will calculate the volume of earth moving of uh, these operations. Also, you see that here you can divide the terrain in different parts, assign different material to each part of the terrain, and so on. In addition, you can import uh, the, the terrain just by looking at the location of the project on the map. 
So uh, since we are based in Barcelona, we are going to see an example in Barcelona, but we can do that for any place in the world. Uh, we select the area, as you see, and the lens design will create a 3D shape of that selected topography in lens design. Um, as you see here, well, we can have the satellite image of the selected area and as well as the 3D terrain of the selected area. And you can get the topography or topographic contours and then uh, work on top of this terrain, like a native terrain of land design. Also, in addition, you can import buildings on the terrain just by looking at the location of the project. In this example, we are going to import the Central Park of New York with all its surrounding buildings. So it's a method for rapid site production, as you see. And uh, well, in this way, if you have no uh, information of uh, surrounding buildings, by looking on the map, uh, you can import them directly into land design. Land design includes dynamic documentation tools that help us to uh, have the list of plants, zoning, uh, urban furniture, and any other material just by one click. Everything is calculated automatically. You can add the image of plants, for example, with a specific command, and produce different types of plans, sections, and documentation. We have parametric hard escape, uh, including parametric walls and curves, parametric paths, parametric fences that let us to produce a fence by ourselves. And there's a block library of furniture inside the program, but you can also import other blocks that are compatible with the program. We have irrigation tools that let us to design the irrigation system of the project, place the sprinkler or emitters, and uh, draw the line of IP. For visualization, we have different tools. We have block mode, virtual simulation. We have sun and shadow tools. There are different render possibilities that are compatible with the program. And uh, there's a, an image filter inside the program. The animation that you see here is made with lens design and Enscape in Rhino environment. So, there are some specific features of Rhino version that are not working in AutoCAD. Uh, as you may know, Rhino is compatible with more than 50 file formats. That is a plenty of uh, possibilities um, that you can open AutoCAD or set of files in Rhino and continue working on those files, for example. Rhino provides us free for modeling, uh, like what you see in this image on the left. So this kind of preform modeling is quite uh, easy to create by Rhino. Uh, the licenses can be on Cloud Zoo. And there are IFC support, um, so you can export the project to IFC and uh, open it in other BIM programs, for example, in uh, Archicad or in Revit. Also, there are parametric design with Grasshopper that is possible in Rhino version of Lance design. Uh, so you can use the algorithms to produce a, a model or to analyze a model. Uh, also, we have Lance design inside Revit. So there's a possibility from Rhino version of Lens Design that you can open the project or modify the project uh, directly in Revit environment. Uh, you may know the parametric design term. So we use parametric design, uh, we use algorithms and by a parametric design tool in Rhino in, by use of Grasshopper, we produce, we create a geometry or we associate data by use of a parametric design tool to the model. And in this way, we do different kinds of calculations and analysis. This is an advanced feature that is possible in Rhino version of the program. So as I said, uh, we have Grasshopper as parametric design tool of the of lens design. Uh, we have Grasshopper components, as you see here, different, uh, different objects of lens design uh, have its own, uh, let's say, uh, grasshopper components. This is an example of what we can do, for example, with grasshopper and with lens design. We are going to draw uh, just a place on plants on lens design, and then 
with a specific defin definition that we, we have in Grasshopper. We can place plant pots by moving the pots because they are associated with plants. So by moving the plants, uh, plant pots also uh, are moving and um, the diameter of plant pots are, uh, are related with the diameter of the plants. This is just um, the use of an algorithm. Uh, so we can have an unlimited number of algorithms and uh, different types of uh, innovative ideas. Uh, another advanced uh, feature is that we have environmental analysis in land design by associating the environmental data through Grasshopper to land design model. We uh, create different uh, analysis, for example, CO2 calculation, cooling effect, shadow analysis or solar radiation study. Uh, about beam workflow with land design now we have IFC support as I mentioned before and we have land design inside Revit. As you see this is a land design project in Rhino environment on left by moving the object or uh, modifying the project. Uh, you see that uh, everything is uh, modified in Revit as well. So this is the linkage that we uh, developed for Revit users that are looking for a solution uh, for landscape architecture. This is the design process with land design. You may start the design by having, if you have the topography information, by, or if you import it by looking the location on the map. Once you have topography, you can elevate the topography contours and create a terrain by using them. Once the terrain is created, you can modify it by control points. Uh, you can zonify the project in different zones. Land design gives you the area, calculate the area, and you can assign the material and the hatch pattern on each zone. In continue, you can insert plants individually or in a row or uh, in a group of plants. Plants may have natural variation as well. So you can decide that the, the plants have different size and shape or, or size and rotation in, in a row. Well, in continue, you can insert other types of elements or hard escape elements if you have wall or pass, or if you have fences. You can add blocks from block library, or as I said, from any other blocks that are compatible with the program. Um, as you see here, well, you can shift between 2D and 3D at any moment. So you see the project in 2D, you do any kind of modification in 2D and uh, everything changes in 3D as well. But here, finally, in continue, you insert the list of plants, earth moving, furniture, and other tools. And finally, you render the project. Well, and on this diagram, we see that how is the workflow with lens design uh, you start a technical drawing in Rhino or in AutoCAD or Civil Tree. In continue, you continue modeling, landscape modeling with lands design. And if you have geographic data, for example, if you have them file, digital elevation models, or if you have point clouds uh, or GIS files, you can uh, open them directly in lands design. Lands design can create a terrain based on them files, for example. Then in continue for visualization, you can apply a render uh, like Enscape, V-Ray, Twin Motion that are compatible with the program. You can apply a virtual reality or use a 3D printer to print your project. You can export your documents to, to Excel or to PDF, for example, or print your drawings, of course. You may have collaboration with other programs, for example, SketchUp, Revit, 3D Max, uh, through IFC, and uh, in case of Revit, through Lands Design Inside Revit workflow. These are some examples of different render, uh, rendering that we applied with Lands Design in case of Rhino version in these examples. Uh, so Enscape, V-Ray, Green Motion, and Lumion are renders that uh, we show here, but there are other renders that are also compatible. If you have any question, you can ask them later on. Uh, so, 
the, you can do the whole project uh, with land design, including drawing, drafting, concept plan, and different types of uh, drawings, as you see. You can finally apply a render, shot a render, and you know, produce uh, this kind of photorealistic results. Uh, well, so in just in summary, land design is available in Rhino, AutoCAD, or Civil 3D. Uh, there's a 90-day free trial. Uh, the licenses are permanent, so you don't need to pay any subscription fee or any kind of um, annual fee. Uh, you will have free technical support from our team, and um, there are educational and lab licenses at, at a reduced price. And as you can see them later on our website. Up to now, do you have any question? Francis is going to continue with the developing the project in land design. There we go. So, hi everybody. Uh, we'll basically see uh, now what Elham has described in this presentation with a, with a light demo, where we will see the, the main features of land design. And first of all, I would like to, to show the, well, to, to have an overview of the main toolbar. Basically, we've got here a land objects toolbar where we can find all the commands to insert vegetation elements. Okay, they can be inserted individually or uh, from points. If you have, for example, DWG with the location of uh, the plants uh, by points, you, there is a, this command to, to pick them and uh, place a specific plant on, on each point. Or uh, if, if you have got some blocks, because you've got a DWG file also with the blocks that are meant to be the, uh, the plants in your project, you can also convert these blocks into real plants in 3D. Okay. And there is also this plain uh, paint mode to insert plants. But well, plants can be also arranged in rows, in forests, in traps, uh, in ground covers, as we can see here. Um, in Topiari, basically, there is this command that wraps uh, some any piece of geometry with uh, with elements, with vegetation elements. We've got civil work elements such as walls, fences, stairs, uh, paths, uh, or row of, rows of elements that we can browse from the library. Basically, this will open um, a file browser where you can uh, insert any uh, 3D model. Um, with a file format that is compatible with Rhino. And as you may know, Rhino can handle over 50 uh, different file formats. So it's quite uh, usual to, to find a block on the web that you can use uh, or you can insert inside Rhino. So that command lets you insert these blocks and also arrange them in, in rows. Then we've got here some uh, terrain modeling commands. We have seen already how to import uh, terrain from the web with this command. But we can also create terrain from points and curves. And we will see some of these uh, commands to do operations, for example, to pick the boundary or to uh, add a path to terrain or a cotton field. Okay. Then we've got some documentation tools here in this uh, other toolbar. So we've got some irrigation tools to uh, generate some sprinklers that can be arranged in a array as well. Then we've got the listing commands. We can list all the landscape elements that we are inserting here. And we've got some uh, tagging uh, commands, some labeling commands, okay, that they are linked to, to the element that we select. Uh, some plant photos, some labels, some dimensions, all of them are linked to the 3D model. So that's why we're talking about beam in landscape. So all these uh, annotations are linked always with the 3D model. So if they uh, change all these documentation updates. And then we've got another command to calculate the slopes, to define areas, or uh, drop some shadows uh, under the under the plants. And finally, here we have got a mix of commands, right? The first one is the, the one that opens this edit panel that they already have in this, uh, in this area. This is probably the most important uh, dialogue in land design. We'll see why in a few seconds. This is uh, uh, the command that opens the lands animation panel. So when we uh, generate a very simple animation at the end of this presentation, we'll see how it works. And then we've got uh, well an access to the plant database. 
Uh, also, there is a built-in application to uh, apply filters to any image. This is meant to be used on the render that you produce in Rhino. So you have already some tool here to open these images and apply some filters. A command to set different uh, viewpoints okay, for short and renders. And also use this wall mode to navigate through the project interactively. Okay, Maybe we'll see that at the end of the, the presentation. So let's take a look at the uh, Lance Edit panel. Uh, well, when nothing is selected, we'll see here a list of the, all the species that we uh, have in this model. So this is a, a small project with a, of a garden. And I have already these uh, species. Okay, We can see here the number of units. And actually, we can also hide them from this icon if we click inside it. Okay? And when we select each one of these species, you will see at the bottom part of this dialog that we can change uh, its representation. So we've got two. Uh, different representation modes for the 2D crowd. So kind of uh, setting out symbol and more detailed 2D drawing. But also in 3D, we have a 2D elevation, a 3D conceptual shape, a detailed 3D shape. This one is not uh, visible. Maybe I'm gonna select another species. So you see what I'm talking about. And finally, there is this realistic uh, representation, which is um, a representation that can store different variations of the 3D model. And each one can have different materials or different appearance. So uh, and they can be assigned to different seasons. That's why we can shot a render uh, assigned to a specific season and the plant will be displayed in one way or another. It will be rendered in one way or another. Actually, if we scroll down here, we can set which is the season we are currently now. And you will see that some plants, for example, if I switch this to uh, autumn, some plants will switch to a different representation um, because they have a different color of the leaves or uh, they, uh, all the leaves just fall down in, in uh, cold, uh, with cold weather. So basically we will have this, we'll use this realistic representation for shooting renders and uh, using a season uh, chain simulation, all right? Um, well, what we are seeing here, even though this 3D has already the textures okay, of, uh, of, the, of the plant, is replaced by a more detailed plant when uh, we shot the render. Okay, so uh, we should shoot the render here now. This plant will be replaced by a more detailed plant. So this is just a simplified version uh, for the sake of good performance when we uh, model with land design. And actually each species, for example, if we take a look at uh, maybe this, uh, this one, uh, it can you can decide which is the level of detail that you want to uh, see the plant with uh, when you are working. Okay, so for example, if we edit this uh, this species here at the bottom, we can define if we want a realistic detail, a high realistic detail in viewport or a low. Okay, so the plant will be displayed with less or, or more detail. But in any case, this plant will be um, this plant species will be rendered with a high level of detail uh, when we when we shut it in. All right. So here from the from this edit panel, when nothing is selected, we can switch to the elevation, to conceptual, to detailed, and finally to a realistic. Okay. So we can also use a billboard representation. So when we are working on a model, models with a large number of plants, this is a good option if we want to, we still want to see the plants you know, in rendered mode. So um, I'm gonna start by inserting a zone, first of all, basically because in the design modeling process, we usually, uh, well, defend we want to have the areas um, of, the, of the project and we want to know the amount of square meters that we're gonna uh, assign for each uh, region. And we already have a few zones here, like this circulation area or this uh, side part here. And well, I'm gonna define in this empty spot, a new area that I'm gonna call uh, the playground. Okay, so I'm gonna work on the top viewport. Um, also, I forgot to mention that we can always switch from 3D to 2D with these buttons. So all the land elements will be displayed with a 2D representation. So now we can see this 2D crown representation of plants and other objects like uh, areas or we'll see later on terrains 
are displayed with a hatch or a, or, or contour lines. Okay. So now, if I work from the from the top viewport, I can run this uh, zoneify command, and now I can just either pick a point inside an empty area or select this option, the boundaries in the command line, so I can already pick a curve that I previously drew, and we can call this playground. And here we can define either the hatch pattern in 2D, but also I can define the material uh, of this uh, area when we show the model in 3D. Okay, there is a library of materials available in, in land design. For example, we can assign kind of gravel for this playground. Uh, but of course, you can use any material that you have in, in, your, in Rhino, because if you're using V-Ray or another render plugin, you can also use the, the materials provided by, by them. Okay? But Lance Design already has a library of materials that you can use with some uh, quick you know, settings for editing the reflectivity or transparency or the scale of it. So I click OK. I need to place the label name. And now this playground is generated here. So I can select it and change it from the edit panel. So also the edit panel is used to edit anything that we select in the in the model. Okay, so we can change the, the name, we can change the the well the hatch uh, attributes and so on. Okay, same for the material and so on. <laughs> okay, so well, since we have already a few zones here, we could already list them. So I'm gonna use this uh, zone listing, zoning list command. Okay, so I can already place a list of zones. And if I select this list, I can check the features of it. So I can uh, decide which uh, fields are displayed. For example, I want to show some sample icon. Okay. And uh, well, and some other, you can explore here some other features uh, for the zoning and uh, for the listing that are common to all uh, listing commands. All right. Um, let's let's go on. I'm gonna insert a, a plant now. Mm. So the um, plants are the, the basic element in land design, of course. And I'm gonna just insert a, a simple plant. Okay. So when I run this command, first of all, appears this dialog that shows me the list of plants of species that have been already used in this document. So in an empty file, you would have this uh, list empty, of course. But you just need to click on this Browse button, which will launch the um, uh, plant database, and just need to explore in the plant database uh, for the uh, desired species. So here you can find all these filters, all these uh, plant characteristics, soil types, so just by selecting uh, all these filters, the list will show you know, the uh, species that match these criteria, all right? Um, there are already a few groups of plant species. So there are all the species that uh, are assigned as favorites. As you can see there are some with this head marked. So you can have your custom list of uh, favorite list of species, those that you frequently use in your projects and display them with this, uh, with this dropdown. Or uh, you can also, for example, use well, filter the species that are meant to be used for vertical gardens. Okay, there are a few species that have a 3D representation that are suitable for, uh, for vertical gardens. Or, uh, well, you can show the plants that have a specific uh, 3D file um, created for that species. That means that not all the plants, because there are over 8,000 species in the plant database, not all these 8,000 have their own you know, realistic file. Um, some of them use a uh, file of another species that is similar to, to it according to the uh, shape, the plant shape, the plant type. Okay. So, uh, well, in any case, you may want to uh, develop your own realistic file uh, if you're using a species that maybe the, the realistic file is not really accurate. So you have the option also to, to, to develop your own one. Okay. Or if there is some missing species, you can also create a new one from this empty, empty sheet. Okay. You can also duplicate a species and start from, from the copy and just need to fill uh, this, you know, this, uh, 
the ship and well select for example which are the display modes for the plant in 2d in 3d uh, conceptual also the render okay here in this case we put a sign one of the uh, files that we've got for the for the uh, realistic representation okay for example this this one and we could also launch the plant editor actually there are two plant editors um, that are used have been used to generate the realistic plants in land design but just one of them the old one comes built in uh, the product okay in this case this uh, file is generated with a with a, a new one so you can if I click yes it could you know uh, launch it and uh, develop a new a new plant species but maybe if I select another species that use a different uh, file maybe this one if I launch a plant editor now this is using this you know file format out of plant X which uh, has been generated with a with an old uh, plant editor excuse me I've got this in Spanish but here you can just play with all the parameters for the scale for the uh, length of the of the branch okay the how arched it is and well just play around with all these parameters sign textures to the trunk to the leaves and you can later on assign uh, that definition to one specific season or another okay so the new editor is a little bit more uh more developed than this one so you, there are more options to create your own realistic files i'm gonna say no this time i'm gonna cancel this but the idea is that you can develop your own plant species if the, if the, the one that you are looking for is missing and you can edit the existing ones you can uh, develop your own realistic representations and just customize uh, the plant species all right you can also uh, use for this uh, this field to uh, look for a specific species so i'm gonna look for a for a lemon tree okay a citrus lemon select it and now well i just need to define the height of the plant um, if I have this natural variation and this random rotation, this will make that if I insert several units of this plant species, all of them will be rotated from one to another. And um, even though they have a specific height, uh, there will be a slight, some slight changes that will make uh, give a, give the feeling that uh, all plants are different from one to another. Okay, even though they are using the same, uh, let's say, block definition. All right, so I insert the plant species. So here it is, the lemon tree. Now, yeah, I can select it. And again, we can change the parameters from the edit panel. We can change the, the species. All right, we can uh, do anything we want. Okay, um, let's let's move on. Um, just let me know if you have any questions, Elham. If somebody has some comments, feel free to stop me and I will. I will yeah, just... I have one question, please. All right. Uh, you are ahead. saying you are saying that if we make uh, a new plant in the editor, we can mm -hmm. keep it. But we work as a team, so we each other have uh, not the same computer. Can we share okay. the editor? Yeah. Yes, you can. All the changes that you do on the plant database will be. Um, can be saved in a kind of common uh, folder in in the same server. If you are connected to the same server, okay, you can have yes. like a kind of centralized folder where all these changes are applied. Okay, oh, okay. So in the land design options. Uh, you go to data data sources. Okay, here you can choose a centralized folder. So any change you do in the plant database, if you create new species, will be stored there. So uh, everyone from their computer can you know can uh, okay. put the same folder and they will have the same changes okay okay nice. all right so let's go to let's let's go to to the terrain modeling tools let's explore a little bit uh, the possibilities that land design offer um there are two options to manage terrain in land design one is by just you know modeling uh topography either with a with a mesh, either with a, a surface like like this one. This is a, you know a, a, just a, a run surface. Okay, we've got these these control points. We, we can just 
created in a hundred of different ways. But imagine that we want this to be the live stream. Basically, uh, we want that all the plants that we uh, model on top of it, they are just projected on top of it. Um, so there is a way to do this, basically is uh, tagging this object as a terrain. And we can do that when we select it from the edit panel with this option that is uh, tag as terrain. When we do so, any plant that we place within you know, the boundary of this, of this terrain will be projected on top of it. Okay, when we release this, we can see that the plants are, you know, uh, placed on top of it. In order, if we move these plants, they will, will keep attached to the, to the position of the of the of the of the surface. If we place them outside of the of this boundary, they will uh, lose this this attachment. Okay, but as soon as they detect the surface, they will be placed on on top of it. Okay, but well, this um, this surface doesn't have all the possibilities that the land design terrain uh, commands offer. So we cannot uh, generate these paths or divisions or cuts and fields, right? In order to do that, we need a proper land design terrain and we can create them from curves or, point or points or a mix of curves and points. So actually we could, you know, uh, generate some contours on the surface and use it for the, for the terrain or we can just create it from, from scratch. So I'm gonna just hide, delete this surface. And we're gonna imagine a different situation that it's quite uh, also common, where we've got a DWG file with the contour lines. And the air contour lines, you know, uh, flatten in uh, the same uh, plane. So if each contour line means to be, a, well, an elevation line, a specific uh, height, we need to elevate them, you know, accordingly. And of course, we've got only four in this case, but we could have a model with uh, dozens of these uh, uh, curves, as you can imagine. So there is this command, elevate curves, that will allow us to elevate these curves according to an interval. So we need to draw a line, and all the curves that intersect with this line will be elevated according to this uh, increment. We can also define star dimension, and I'm gonna set here 0 0.5, for example, and click apply to elevate these lines. If I close this, I will realize that curves are elevated. If uh, I wanted to change that elevation, I can just repeat this command again. Uh, I draw the line again. And now I'm gonna change the increment to one. So basically from the first curve, okay, that has been elevated one meter, uh, the increment now will be uh, one. Click apply, and that's what we've got now. Okay. All right, so we have the curves in uh, in the desired location. So now we are ready to run the uh, terrain command. So when I click on it, this dialog appears. And here I basically need to define, um, well, the method of creation of the terrain basically there is this uh, option by default uh, enabled, which is the grid surface shape to articulation. This uh, basically will define the terrain as a mesh uh, created from a cell, okay, from a cell which dimension can be set from here, or we can use a pure Delaunay triangulation with all the points of the curve that we use as input data, okay. But with this option, we'll have full control of you know the of the terrain accuracy. So we're gonna start with a, with a terrain of one by one uh, cell size. We can also assign a base here as well. And finally, I'm gonna select these four curves to generate the, the terrain. Okay. Um, I'm gonna hide the, the layer where I had these curves. I don't need them anymore. They are not attached anymore to the terrain. But uh, if I select the terrain, I will realize that uh, all the control points of those curves are now uh, used by the terrain uh, to modify its topography. So we can select the control points of this of terrain and just modify it by pulling these, uh, these control points. Okay? Um, of course, the more complex these curves are, 
the, the original ones, the more coded ones will have on that terrain to, to change its topography afterwards. Also, we can see there is a gap here. So you can add more contours to the terrain if we, we didn't select in the first moment. And I'm going to do this with this command, add contour. So I select terrain. And now I need to pick a curve. So I know that I have one curve here. And this will be integrated into the into the terrain. OK. Um, as if we had uh, selected it from the very beginning. Some other things that we can apply on this terrain, for example, I'm going to show this in ghosted mode because I'm going to uh, trim the terrain according to a closed curve. I'm going to use this a rectangle as the boundary of the, of the new terrain. Now, the terrain goes a little bit you know, outside it. So, OK, I run this command. It's a big boundary command. Um, we just need to follow the instructions in the command line. So this is quite uh, user-friendly. I mean, uh, it's quite intuitive to, to go through any, any command. So just need to follow the steps. So it's like the terrain. I pick a closed curve. So that's a rectangle. And, and that's it. So now the terrain has been trimmed by this, by this uh, polyline. And now we can uh, do some operation on the terrain. For example, we can add a path since we've got this, this curve here. And the terrain will be modified in order to fit with, the, uh, with that curve. So it's important that when you do this kind of operation, you have already that curve in a specific elevation. Okay? So the slope of this path will be determined by the slope of this curve in the, in the 3D model. Okay? Um, I'm going to put this back to render it, which looks nicer, of course. And here we have this add path command. So I need to pick the terrain, define the path width, let's say three meters. The slope uh, along, the, uh, along the path, basically how the terrain will be adapted to fit with a, with a, a path along, along its, uh, this curve. And finally select a curve. I have this divide set to yes, so this will let me apply some material to the area of the path later on. Just like this, this curve and, and that's it. Okay, I have this division, and now if I select the terrain, I also have the control points of the curve used for the path integrated inside this, this terrain. I can enable the gamble, for example, if I want to pull it down a little bit more easily. All right. Uh, or we can change the path a little bit, position just by pulling this complete path. Now, all the data that we have been using on the terrain is stored on that object. If we select it, and we go to the lands edit panel, here under the input data, we'll see the list of all these fifth uh, curves okay, that we used for creating the terrain, but also the, uh, the path, so we can change the, let's say the, um, the width from here, so we can change the, the, the angle. So the terrain basically works as a parametric object that stores all the data that we have used to generate it. And that way we can apply changes and uh, well edit it very easily. We've got also here the, the subdivision. And we can generate a zone out of it. Or we can select the subdivision from this uh, list and assign, assign a specific material. So here we can use also uh, material from uh, the library. So maybe I can just select a different type of grass on that, on that area. Okay. Um, uh, well, actually, I didn't show this into this. So actually, terrains are displayed with uh, some contour lines. I can also uh, set the, well, the settings of these uh, contour lines from here. Basically, this is the, well, by default, they are divided into. 10 contours, which doesn't make really sense because we need to have control of the, you know, the distance between each contour. So I'm going to select this option. And since, since this is not very high, I'm going to just show uh, contours every 20 centimeters. And here, there is this interesting option to highlight specific contours every certain number of contours. Okay, So I'm going to assign specific attributes every each uh, certain number of contours. Um, well, also, this 2D representation can be displayed simultaneously 
to the 3D representation of objects. For example, in the case of the terrain, using this show 2D and 3D, it could be an interesting option to uh, also see the contours when we're working in 3D, which gives us a better feedback of how the, uh, well, how the cover topography uh, is, is generated. Okay. And well, since we also uh, applied some changes on the terrain in comparison to the, to the first uh, terrain we obtained from these curves, we can generate here a terrain list with this command. Okay, that will show the amount of uh, land that has been added and subtracted from the uh, add path uh, operation. Okay. So this data, as well as with the zoning list, is always attached to the 3D model. So if uh, we consider that we need more dig volume, so it, you know it's uh, more uh, balanced with uh, with a fill volume, we can um, well we can take any of these control points of the of the path. I think it's maybe. Mm, I'm gonna pick this one. Actually, you know, there is one useful thing here. If you don't want to select control points, of course, that you don't want to to see. You go to the input data. You select this elevation data and disable the show control points. And now, when we select the terrain, we'll just see the control points of the of the path in this case. Okay, so maybe we can select this uh, this control point. We we dip it a little bit. So the range just sinks a little bit more into the terrain, and you can see that this value has updated. Okay, maybe we've got now just very small uh, field volumes. It wouldn't be that equal, but anyway, you should uh, you have here the tools to you know, to, to work with that and and find a good balance. Um, all right, as you have seen also, when we work with the range, plans are automatically you know. Uh, generated on top of them. They are automatically projected on top of them. Um, and this is done because when we created the plants, we've got this icon uh, enabled. So you can still say uh, a plan to do not adjust the terrain if you want it to have, you know, attached to another object or floating because uh, you don't want basically to, to be placed on a specific, you know, position you, or you want to offset it a little bit. You can place it freely if you uh, mark it to do not be adjusted to, to terrain, okay? But by default, any object that we uh, insert with this uh, icon enabled will be projected on the, on the terrain automatically. Um, good, let's see more uh, features to insert plans. Okay. Uh, is there an option to ask uh, two questions? Yeah, sure. sure. Go ahead. Um, so the first one is, and um, the contour lines right now is a little bit like a, a jagged zigzag. Mm -hmm. And it, maybe I want to have a, get a result for a more straight line, more accuracy, um, especially where is the road are, uh, are located mm -hmm. and the option to do it. And the second question is about the list um, from which uh, how how does the cut and fill is calculated from which surfaces is related to? Yeah. Okay. So about the first question, uh, unfortunately, there is no right now good way to uh, draw these contour lines as a smooth curves because uh, the terrain is actually a mesh and is a mesh that is generated by uh, by a cell, you know, a squared cell. That means that when these uh, curves are uh, generated, they are finding the intersection with a mesh that it's not a smooth object. It's always a, you know, a jagged object. And that's why they do this, you know, this kind of uh, these zigzags. Mm -hmm. uh, this is something that we would like to improve. So uh, hopefully someday we'll have a better, you know, generation of, generation of uh, curves. Yes. Uh, but right now, right now they, they show up a little bit be, be jagged. You have the option to change the, you know, the cell size. So maybe you get a better results, but, uh, but yeah, at some point they will find, you know, they will adapt, try to fit with, you know, with a, with a cell uh, mesh. And yeah, they, they, they are showing up with this, with this exam. 
And regarding your second question, um, well, when we apply, uh, when we calculate the fill and tick volume, it's always comparing the original terrain uh, without taking into account, I mean, taking into account the, all the all the trim and the curves added to it, with the terrain that we've got after the uh, a cut and fill or the um, the hole or this um, yeah pad operation. Okay. So these are the three operations that are taken into account when calculate the volume of uh, earth moving on a terrain. All right. Okay. Thank you. And, um, maybe okay. I can I can show very quickly how to add uh, the how the cotton field you know works. For example, in this case, I want to flatten an area based on this rectangle. So if I move this rectangle a little bit inside the inside the terrain, so the part that is inside will be removed, and what is at the bottom will be filled in order that the terrain fits with the position of this rectangle. We can also um, Inclinate this rectangle a little bit. So uh, again, in this case, well, the terrain will try to fit its position, you know, so it matches with the plane of this of this curve. Okay. So in this case, we run the cut and fill command. We pick the terrain. Again, we select the slope around the, that contour and select that curve. Okay, that, and then the, the terrain just tries to too much with the position of this of this uh, of this contour. Okay. All right. Um, let's let's move on. I'm gonna insert now a, a forest. Uh, before before moving on, uh, just mm -hmm. let's see how cotton field appears on the terrain list, please. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the the cotton field. You can see that the big big volume is now zero. But again, we can select this uh, this terrain, and uh, and there is well here we've got the four control points of this terrain, and there is actually a control arrow that lets us move the whole you know this whole boundary. Maybe sometimes it's not visible in rendered, so we've got it here, and we can just use this control arrow to move you know the whole boundary. A bit down or another position, so all the all this you know uh, surface will will be sinked a little bit into the terrain. Now we can see that the cotton field field volume has has changed. Okay. All right. So yeah, let's insert now a, a forest. So well, I'm gonna run the forest command. So basically, here we need to select again first species. For example, this Citrus Atlantica. It's fine. And from the forest tab, we set the uh, well the parameters of the forest. For example, I'm gonna put a number of thirty units. Also, this is important the minimum distance. So you may have a, like a if you set like a big distance, you may have the feeling that not all the these plants can be fit. You know, with these parameters. So be aware of the value you insert here. And later on, we'll, I mean, explore these options. But when I say okay, I can either pick a closed boundary, or I can draw it using any of these uh, options in the command line. For example, I'm going to use a polyline and work from the top viewport. I'm going to disable those snaps. So basically, we'll just generate the forest around it. I don't need to close this curve. I mean, when I hit enter. This boundary closes automatically, and we've got now the forest created here on top of this, this terrain. We select it, and now we can uh, change the parameters of the forest. For example, we want more units here, or we want to uh, display it arranged in array of uh, four by four. Okay. We can also combine species in a forest. So here we can say that we can tell that we want two different elements. Once we do this, we select you know, each one of the species from this list, and we select the uh, new new species. For example, we want a uh, jacaranda, or we want to we can browse in the plant database for a, a different species. For example, a uh, I don't know. 
Para Paraguay. Esers. Por ejemplo, this one. Which is quite nice. And well, you can see that it's quite easy to work with these uh, objects. Okay. Just select one species or another, you change here the parameters related to that species. And uh, well, if they, in the same way, we were editing individually the, the, the plants. Okay. Um, well, today I won't have time to go through all these. Uh, all these elements, maybe it's worth it to mention the ground cover command. So this is a, a, well, a vegetation element that is using a different realistic plant in a way that it, uh, well, it generates a 3D, but not as an individual element, but as a, you know, as a 3D element that is spread over an area. So we can draw the area or pick an existing curve, for example, I'm gonna pick this curve, you know, to create a ground cover on top of it. Of course, this. On the this curve that ground cover is uh, projected on the terrain, and we can also pull this change the control points to uh, well to adapt this uh, ground cover on the surface of the of the terrain. This ground cover can be used also for vertical gardens, as I mentioned before. Even the forest command, we just need to insert them in a vertical plane. For example, I've got this vertical curve here. Okay. This is a vertical curve that I have drawn previously. So if I run the ground cover command and select that curve, the plants will be you know, generated, uh, projected on that, on that plane. Okay, on the ground, I can select this uh, ground cover, change its density, change the scale, okay. And, well, play with all these parameters, so it's more, more dense. All right. And uh, well, we can insert already a plant list. Okay. Uh, we, uh, we have inserted some different species. Actually, I'm going to move this toolbar up there. So I have more area for the interface. Interface, And under the documentation list, I will insert a plant list. Okay. Um, well, there are many different options for uh, for displaying the information of these uh, plants. That is, there are many ways that uh, we have introduced, introduced some new features in, in the upcoming version of land design, the 5.8. And uh, here we have these filters, so we can filter plants by, by layer. Uh, so we can select plants that we have in one specific layer by region. That means that if you just want to uh, show the plants in that in that area, okay, we can tell this list to uh, to select, you know, to be displayed by region. So I select this boundary, and only the plants in that area will be displayed in this list, and not including this forest. That maybe it's something that is out of our project. Okay, so there are some new features regarding. The, uh, the way uh, list uh, display the, the formation of objects, of elements we have in the model. So it's quite, quite powerful. Um, and again, all the changes we do on the 3D model will affect this, uh, this plant. If we maybe select this plant row, okay, we've got um, seven units of this, uh, of this element, which is the the Cedrus Atlantica. Okay, so we have this here 11 because maybe we have another plants over here. But if we change that uh, row to, uh, for example, um, separation of uh, two, you can see that the number has increased also in this in this list. Okay. Um, good. Let's let's explore a little bit the um, civil work elements. Maybe we can insert a, a wall here. Basically, a wall is a parametric object defined by a height and a thickness, and also has a material assigned. And we click OK, and we can draw it selecting a, a curve, or we can just select any of these options to draw it on the plan. So I'm going to 
Uh, select this corner and just draw the, the wall following this, this boundary. Okay. And well, if you want to match the properties of a, of a wall from another, there is an option here, which is copy property from another object. Would be quite useful, you know, to to just um, equalize the the attribute of, uh, between different lands that design elements. Um, all right. Let's insert a row of elements. Maybe that's also an interesting feature. To, there is an option here. to create slope slope wall in Rhino. Yes, this, want... these walls. If you have this. Uh, option enable, they will follow the the terrain. Okay. Uh, for example, if I draw a, a wall following these limits, okay, I'm gonna draw a polyline here. Maybe I'm gonna to make sure I draw on top of the terrain. I can just you know follow this this border. And that, uh, okay, maybe I'll just throw it outside. I'm gonna change the, I'm just gonna move it a little bit inside. So the, the wall will just follow the terrain, okay? Um, be aware that the points of this wall are within the limits of the terrain. So they will, they will uh, you know, detect the terrain and be projected on top of it. But yeah, any of these walls, if you uh, select the control points, maybe I'm going to show this in wireframe. But you know you can just pull them uh, down or up, so you can have like inclined walls. Okay. All right. Um, so I was going to show the the, the element row in line design. So when I run this command. Here, we need to pick an element for a sample for the row. This could be either uh, something, some piece of model, piece of geometry we have in the model. We could select it from, from this icon. We can browse any file from our, you know, from, from our uh, library, our library, or we can look for uh, a block in the line design library, which offers some uh, blocks for different, you know, different urban, uh furniture elements maybe we can insert some lighting objects or some <clears throat> uh, some stones all right maybe maybe lighting in this case and in from the row tab we can define the parameters of this uh, of this row for example we want a separation of five meters and we've got here all the parameters that we can play with for example, since I'm going to use this uh, this curve, I want it. I want to draw these lights, you know, a little bit uh, offset from this from this curve. So I'd say that I want one point half meter away from the from the path. I click OK. I select this curve, and I've got all these, you know, all these row of elements. One point five meter away from this path curve. Later on, I can select that. Uh, I can change the sample if I want. I can change these parameters, maybe change the separation. Um, but there are other uh, possibilities that you can explore here. For example, there are different orientation options. If the one that uh, but it's not suitable, so there are many possibilities here to to play with. So the blocks, you know, orient uh, to the desired position. And well. Of course, now we can uh, generate a urban uh, furniture list. Okay, we've got here all the all the elements, and again, we can filter this by selecting the boundary of uh, of the part of the project that we want to include in this list, and or just filter by layers and and other details. Um, all right, let's let's move on. Maybe it's worth it to uh, well, to see the plant shadows. It's 
this is a command to drop some you know some shadows at the bottom of uh, to the plants. Um, these shadows have a specific direction and, and height according to the sun position. It's not really related to the geolocation orientation or the real orientation of this project. Um, so it's just for you know for display purposes for presenting the to the drawing. Um, but actually, if we want to do a kind of a sun sh or shadow simulation, we can also you know uh, enable the, the sun in Rhino. You know, that we've got this interesting command that based on a date and time and geolocation, uh, we can do some kind of a, uh, you know, shadow simulation along, uh, along, along a day at a specific uh, daytime or day of in the, in the year. So we have a, a good idea of how the shadows, you know, variation along, along the day or along the year on, on our project. Um, by the way, this project is geolocated, so we can specify this um, the coordinates from, from the document. Uh, this is also the same values that we can find in the Rhino's document properties when we go to the location, it's the same. And you know that with the earth anchor command, earth anchor point command, we can change that. So this, uh, well, the, uh, these coordinates um, match with the specific point that we define in the model and not with the zero, which is the, the corresponding uh, point right now. All right, let's uh, maybe do some uh, animation, okay, uh, before maybe showing some example of the integration with Grasshopper, uh, if, I, if I have time. Um, so, well, let's move to the animation toolbar. I'm gonna show a layer where I have a, a camera path. Okay, basically this is a curve that we use as the camera path for my, my animation. And well, here under the animation uh, panel, I have the features of this, uh, of how I want to record uh, this video. Basically I can give a name, I can define the animation by uh, frames per second or total duration of it. And here I select a curve as the camera path. Once I have selected, I can actually hide this object again. And uh, well, here I have some camera options. And I can either use to uh, shot, or shot this animation using the Rhino's current display or the uh, current renderer. If I do this, there will be you know, render you know, being shot for every frame of this animation. If I choose that just the display, I will have the option to see a quick uh, overview of how this animation uh, looks like. It would be the previous step to shot uh, a real recording with a good quality of, of its own. Okay. Hey, can I talk? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, we are starting to enter in animation and here in the studio, we use uh, 3D glasses to see yes. 360. So my question is that if we can use it in this program too, or if we can use it uh, making virtual reality. I so you would like to so use your, uh, your landscape model with with 3D Studio, you mean? No. Sorry, I didn't quite understand. Can, can you repeat the question, please? Yeah. We want to use the 3D glasses. Yeah. So I'm asking if we can use it here with this program to see three, uh, 360 degrees. Yeah, yeah, you can, of course. Uh, okay. That's that's possible if you have the tool to create this this um, this three D view, right? For example, I know that Beerway offers this option, so this is of course available if uh, well you have this if you have Beerway or Rhino, because what you have in the model it's nothing but uh, geometry in Rhino. So any render engine or any tools that this render engine on top of Rhino offer, 
can be used with, with Lance Design, of course. Yeah, the problem is that now we only use images because we are using Lumion to render. So can we do with this program uh, virtual, uh, a walk and people can, can see whatever mm -hmm. they want? Yeah, yeah, of course. Absolutely. Oh, thank, you. thank you, Sim, my day. <laughs> Okay, so any more questions? Uh, Francis, we are seeing your desktop. Oh, okay. Well, um, okay. Oh, okay. Maybe it's time to mention that we are we have organized a course of Rhino and Lancizan together. It's six session of course, and in total 12 hours in February. The course is online and it is start, it's starting 6th of February. So you can find more information in Lance Design Learn uh, website. And uh, well, so if you're interested in learning Rhino and Lance Design together, maybe it's time to start. It. Do you see still my desktop or do you see the... Yeah, we are seeing, uh, no, we are watching your desktop. Okay, let me just share again. And maybe I'm gonna share the, the proper screen. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, it's okay. Okay. Um, okay, do, do maybe we have time for a couple of examples of integration with Grasshopper, Elham? Uh, yeah, sure. All right. So, well, as we have seen in the hand introduction, uh, we've got uh, all the landscape elements available in Grasshopper. That means that we can integrate them into the, into the parametric designs, you know, generate with Grasshopper. So basically, for example, when we uh, want to insert plants, create plants in the supper, we go to the lands uh, tab and we can insert a plant. Okay, and this generates a plant on the zero coordinates, which is now somewhere here. But of course, if we have a point in a different uh, location, like here, we can just set this point as a new position of, of the plant. And now we can uh, use these uh, plant options to uh, change the parameters of this, uh, of this species. Now there is no species assigned, but with a right click, I can set one species from the, from the model and maybe with another parameter that goes from one to uh, 40 meters, I can change the, uh, the head of this plant. So imagine that instead of this, we have um, uh, a polar array or a different array. So we've got here this, this radial you know, array. Maybe I'm gonna select this point uh, again as the, as the origin point of this, of this array. And I'm gonna use these points as the position of the plant. So instead of the first point, I mean, instead of this point, I can use this point for placing my, my plant, okay? If this value is bigger, so I will be able to do an array of, a whole array of plants uh, using all the uh, available, uh, all the tools available in the software. Um, so we can also deconstruct plants in order to obtain their values or their characteristics. So here, for example, we've got, um, some elements to deconstruct the plants. So by referencing these plants, we'll be able to obtain the points and obtain the options to know the height of the plant, uh, the species, the information of the species with all, with all this data, we can do many, many other things. For example, I'm gonna show you another, uh, another case. Actually, we have seen a preview in the Lance, in Alhans presentation, but uh, if I go to the shopper, um, okay, with this definition, um, I will generate some pots under the plants, okay, based on the uh, on the head of the, of the plants. So imagine that we insert a few plants here, maybe I'm gonna use this pin mode now. And I select another operation and insert 
this plants over here. Now, I'm going to reference this plant in Grasshopper. And basically, this definition takes the, well, the deconstruct this plant. So, so I know the, you know, the position of these plants. I know the, their head. And this based on the position on the head, I generate some circles at the bottom of them. So you can generate these, these parts. Okay. If I now uh, well, change the position of these plants, all these parts are regenerated. And also, since they uh, are generated from the head of the plants, so of course, they change if I modify the head. So it's basically uh, some simple example of how parametric design can apply, can be involved with landscape elements. And it is just one example of the unlimited possibilities that this combination of tools offer. Well, uh, we recently have published uh, recent videos that has been well, actually the result of our, uh, our last uh, research on how uh, to calculate parametric, well, how to calculate the environmental impacts by using Lands Design and Grasshopper and some other plugins, including Ladybug. This is, a, of course, an advanced level, but for those who are interested, you can find those videos on our YouTube channel, Lands Design on YouTube. I just uh, copied the link of one video that is explaining how Lands Design works inside Revit uh, on chat, if you are interested in that workflow. And for those who are interested in the course, I also placed the, the link of the course in chat. Thank you, everyone. All right. Yeah, Thanks for joining just, today. Yeah. Maybe just to finish, I can uh, maybe show that in the website, you can find plenty of material to learn land design. Uh, mm -hmm. There are some videos, some webinars. Also, there are a few simple exercises to get into the uh, lands. Uh, components in Grasshopper, okay? And well, you will find plenty of learning material, you know, to, to go through all the commands and, and features of Lance Design. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, I will send you the recordings later on to your email. Have a nice day or the rest of the day. Thank you, Francis. All right, thank, thank you. you. Welcome, thank you everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.